Everybody, welcome to another installment of Show to View with Mike G, the show of life, the show of Japan, science, game playing, moving to Austin for love, and so much more with today's guest, Brian Matsumitsu Parsons, now of Kumuri fame and Tatsuya fame, also of Soto in Austin, the Japanese gentleman himself, talking about the lovely category of sochu and sake, and he's even classified as a sake sommelier, so lots of to learn from the man himself, so diverse, entrepreneurial spirit, and everything in between lights up this hospitality industry, and it was just a pleasure getting to chat with him. So without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy this great chat with Brian Masamitsu Parsons. Chicken fried chicken. <laughs> Potatoes, that was not gravy. difficult, was it? Uh, uh-uh, carrots. I, I can still tell you the numbers. Really? Right down as a server, yeah. It's a. There's something special about fried things. Definitely. It's in and I you know had the, so it's nice because they have green chili eggs now. I don't know if you noticed that. I, I did not notice that. It's because it's been a while since you've worked there. Yeah, and I mean, I when I want something southern and fried, they still always hit the spot. It's, um, unlike other things, as you get. Get higher in in level in terms of food and cuisine, right? You know they tend to drop off. Like oh, Olive Garden is not my thing anymore, right? Or Crab, you know these places. But sure. Cracker Barrel is always like safe, yeah. And it it's just something about Southern food just kind of tests the you know it stands the test of time. Always, even though I don't like Leonard Skinner, I'll always listen to Freebird, <laughs> right? So, exactly. <laughs> this is it. it this will is always age well, <laughs> and it's always just meet that guttural need for something simple but something good. Mm-hmm. Southern. All right, good. I got that other one. All right, here's another one. As an avid, self-proclaimed gamer, we are roughly the same age. You're a little bit younger than me, but we both grew up in the NES era. Oh, yeah. So, it's always Contra for me, but for you, what is one of those games that really made you want to game even more from the original NES? Super Mario 3. 3? Well, it's probably tied. Super Mario 3 and Rad Racer. <laughs> Dude, so Rad actually, Racer. I have, I have Rad Racer on my tattoo. Do you really? Yeah, and it's uh, it's one of the games I played, you know, with my dad, and so he's uh, still around. Yeah, but uh, I played, you know, that one a lot. So that one, I have a lot of memories of 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 Rad Racer and uh, Mario Three. It's what I played with my siblings. Like, yeah, I just sat around and just Mario Three all the time. What's it, the so, Tanuki Mario? That yeah. never happened, right? That's like a random thing. And then there's the is. Did he have bombs too? One of the forms of Mario and Super Mario. He too? like jumped in a boot, right, and hopped around, and it didn't make sense. <laughs> what the fuck was like? I'm not in upheaval, especially twenty something years later, because <laughs> it was a great yeah. game. It's like now we're questioning. Now, now, <laughs> but no, I mean that's kind of weird. That's like a psychedelic game in some sense. Do you find that that kind of element where you really don't know what to expect is something maybe you find alluring about video games in general? Oh yeah. It, just like fantasy, sci-fi, all yeah. those things. It's just kind of you embrace it for what it is. You don't really question it. You just kind of enjoy seeing these things that are so different than, say, reality. Sure. Is it vicariously living in a place that's a little bit safer, a little bit more charming? Um, I don't know as much vicariously. It's more just allowing your brain just to kind of absorb it, not question it like you do everything else in daily life, yeah. and just like take it for what it is and and just control that what you can on that screen. I like that. Do what you need to do and focus on that goal. Don't have to overanalyze it. Just yeah. let it be, right? That's why I like Marvel movies. See? So there I, don't, you go. I don't think about it. People want to tear it apart. I'm like, I was entertained. I grew up with comics. I'm happy with what I saw. Did you see um, Black Panther? I haven't seen it. Not yet. Okay. So. You excited about it? Yeah, I usually wait till like week two or three when it's not too crazy. And people don't spill popcorn and shit all over you? Cause or, just... or bring like like newborn babies and, and all that. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, so, real appropriate for newborn babies. Yeah, like we have to see it first week. Baby wants to see it too. <laughs> no, they don't. So um, there's so many facets to this story, Brian. Like 
There's the Japanese inspiration, which coming from your mom's side, as I just found out, we're sipping sochu from Japan. No English copy on there, so I don't know what the proof is. I don't know where it came from, except it came from the glorious country of Japan. Good enough for me for now. But when you first popped, because you were crafted a cocktail for the bourbon, blue glass, and blues, or BBB, B3, whatever. B3. Yeah, yeah thank like, you. I don't know the order, but it's I, B3. <laughs> I tie it all up together. But then I started thinking, well, this guy is kind of a formidable force in spirits. And then I said, well, actually, he's quite an educator on a particular type of spirit. So in the San Antonio Cocktail Conference this year, how did the talk about sake go? Um, well, actually, so for that, for the cocktail conference, I did shochu. Shochu, okay, good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that that's what we're drinking. And that was, um, and yeah, exactly. So perfect with what you brought here. This is delicious. Um, normally, like sake is kind of my bread and butter. Yeah, that's what got me into a lot of the the spirits and, and stuff in the first place. Um, at least now with Japanese cuisine, mm-hmm. shochu is now kind of a new a new thing that I'm really learning and really getting into. Mm-hmm. And so. I did submit for the cocktail conference. Like, hey, I really want to go. Uh, I just submitted a couple of talks that sound interesting. Yeah. If anything, I can go to the conference I've never been before. Awesome. So I did a sake and a shochu seminar, and they picked shochu. So like, awesome. Well, I better get really good at shochu now. It's <laughs> <So laughs> a like, good okay. excuse, isn't it? And granted, I'll, I've been around it for a while now. Especially, um, we had, we did a little shochu at the North Soda when we rebuilt the menu. Yeah. But more like the multi distilled type, that's like vodka. So right like soju so nothing too crazy and then helping you know over open kamuri yeah um mike introduced me with how like he's incorporating everything into western cocktails and so that was my first time really seeing that use as secondary spirits and split bases right and just seeing people actually enjoy it even in its raw form like i've seen in japan which is just with hot water or just with a bunch of juice mm-hmm. like that's how my mom likes to drink it yeah and um and it was just really interesting seeing that and i was like okay this is cool and also having to explain to people why we didn't have vodka but we have something different it's <laughs> a good point that, that was the number one thing people yeah you have vodka we're like no but we have this thing called shochu and always got people into it yeah and so then they're like oh that was good let me try other things and so that's one of the things i love about sake too it's oh you have sake and you go through and usually there's a lot of preconceived notions it's oh i had hot sake or i had sake bombs when right, I was in college right. i don't drink that stuff it's like let me show you what really good sake tastes like absolutely and usually i convert them and i love just i love that the part of the awareness the education and just like introducing all these new styles and trying to fit something that matches that person and then that you just see it open their world yeah and then you see them come in and i said hey i want to try other stuff and that's one of the reasons i love you know i mean i love the cocktail industry in general or a food industry because of that but right really particularly like this current niche that i'm really diving into it's kind of amazing so, or not kind of it, I mean, that is, I, I love that you have this educational component where you want to empower people. Because, you know, sometimes it's like, you want that? Pff, I know it's good for you. Yes. But you're not like that. I can already tell. No, yeah. I, it's like, okay, well, tell me what it is that you say you don't like or yeah. you didn't like before about it. Okay. Like, for instance, we'll have, you know, I had a person the other day come in. It's like, I don't like sake. And they're like, they don't want to tell me why. And they tell me, it's like, okay, every time I even smell sake, I think of vomit. I'm like. Fair. Okay, that's the first time I've ever heard of that. And they're yeah. like, I don't think you can find me anything because they they have it associated with parties in right, college right. and then, of course, afterwards. And I was like, okay, well, I know a lot of people that do association like, yeah, like Jaeger or other things. Like, yeah. I love Jaeger now, but, you know, people bring up these certain things. Where about, man? Yeah, exactly. They're yeah. like, oh, I can't. Uh, but so I'm like, all right. And so I just thought, okay, what is the most off-the-wall sake I have mm. that doesn't taste like sake for most people? So I gave them a... It's like a two-year age Nama Genshu, which is unpasteurized, undiluted. Yeah. On the on our list, it literally says whiskey lover sake because it has so much body, so much wow. bite to it. Not wood or anything like that. It's just it's different. Yeah. And so I just hey try this. They taste and like, oh this is awesome. And like wait is this like shochu? It's like no it's sake. And they're like awesome. Wow. And so they got a glass of that, and after that they're like okay I guess I still like sake. I just gotta <laughs> find the right kind. I'm like exactly. You know, we, we become jaded. We're like, I'm never going to fall in love again. Yeah. And then it just and takes that one thing. There's so much of that. You know, the same thing with like the certain, like we don't carry Tito's. Yeah. We don't carry like even Bombay Sapphire. We have um, Old Highborn. That's hey, all right. Gin. Mike turned me on to that. Cool. And then, we, you know, we have a number of other, we have like Aylesbury. We have Nika Coffee Vodka. We have all these other vodkas. Yeah, yeah. 
because I know that if I put Dripping Springs, Tito's, these easy to find vodkas on list, they're not, nobody's going to try these other other styles. Oh, that's these a great other, point. Yeah. These new styles. So now I sell a lot of Japanese vodka because I've taken away the easy path for most people, mm. forced them to have a conversation, and they're like, "Okay, cool, I'll try it." And then I just say, "Hey, you're going to like it if you don't. You know, it's on us." Sure. And people usually like the alternatives. They realize, "Well, hey, good vodka tastes like good vodka." <laughs> regardless. It's a different deal. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And. And then that gives us, that forces the conversation that even lets us, you know, bring him over to show you and, and things like that. It's a, it's a really interesting spirits. I like spirits for a couple different reasons. One, because it tastes good. And two, because they have a nice uplifting power. Or if you hit the other side of the hill, a little bit of a downtrodden path when you yeah. drink too much, which is great. <laughs> it's all about balance, right? right? It is. And it's constantly testing yourself. Testing <laughs> Your yourself. And, yeah, how, how far can I go and still feel pretty great? Yeah. Right? This is the, the eternal pursuit both in love emotionally and physically of course but that's great but the thing is is you have you could study scotch if you want it's a massive class multiple chapters lots of terroir lots of regionality within the country itself you could talk about mescalis 11 states well actually nine two pending right or you can go home and you can go back to the place where you were most comfortable and rather that is home and kind of familial to you so when you talk about when you're younger what was the alcohol situation like? Did you guys drink with dinner, which is pretty customary? Did you sip things with your mother? It's actually pretty funny. You know, people assume that because I'm now like pretty passionate in terms of just, uh, you know, this industry, yeah. cocktails, all of this, that I grew up drinking a lot or I had a family that was into it. And then actually, um, I was a very late bloomer when it came to drinking. Sure. Um, uh, I lived with my mom for a while up until like, say, middle school age. Yeah. My parents were divorced early on, and then I eventually moved to my dad. They're very religious, so mm. we didn't see much of that. So it wasn't until my early 20s, 22, 23, my first time I even had a drink. Really? Yeah. So it's actually about the same for me, I think. I mean, I, you know. You know, a lot of people you, are like, you oh. You touch it, oh, but. Yeah, I, I drank some at 16, all this. I just, because I was around, and I, I was heavily into religion at that point. With, yeah. What uh, denomination? Well. I'm just curious. I would say not a denomination, okay. leading Southern Baptist. Got it. Okay. But I had friends and you know pentecostals sure. catholic all of it and so i was pretty big into it in high school and because of that you know i was like oh, i'm not gonna do that this this all these vices sure and then i moved out and went to college florida florida university sorry i went so i went to university of west florida okay but they're a satellite campus for university of florida i see okay. so i could do my engineering um dual degree program there yeah but still get my and get my uf uh, certificate or uf bachelors and still live close to home gotcha okay and so it worked out pretty well but um just just even just like an hour difference so my family's from crestview florida okay and i did school in pensacola florida and so just that hour difference made me start thinking more for myself and realize that you know i that some of those things that i was doing wasn't really for me and just didn't yeah. really define me as well and not that you know i i have you know they're they're still that they're still very um Devout? But devout, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Devout. I hate saying religious and no, trying right, to be right. negative about it. But they're very devout. Um, I learned a lot of great, you know, things, morality, all of these things through that and have a lot of great friends still of from course. that. Um, it's a good foundation, right? It is. To build on. Exactly. And so, and I have great respect for, you know, anybody who practices any type of religion because of all of that. Um, Was there a moment for you where it kind of pivots? You know, Andres Chupita Parra, he, he had the same thing. In Florida, he had the same actualization. <laughs> Oddly enough, kind of rifting from... Or creating rift internally with Catholicism. For you, was there a moment or was it just kind of a natural evolution? Um, I think it there has always been a duality to me because I always I had my mom yeah. who does not did not really talk any type of religion, anything like that. She's kinda like, I want you to be happy, you live your life, you do yeah. your thing, you know, and for Japanese, Shinto's a big thing. Yeah, Shinto yeah. or Buddhism. And so and for years I was always trying to convert her. I'd send her Japanese Bibles, all these things. <laughs> she was like, No, it's cool. And just the way she was very patient and all of that versus what I was taught, which is I have to convert everybody. I have to, I have to, or it's bad, you know, and, and yeah. all, all these different things I was taught. And, you know, it, I don't know, something about that reflected back on me. I was like, you know, I really dig the way she was about it. And other Japanese people I met or people just in Eastern philosophy, sure. where it's just like, you know, it's like, I'm doing my best. I'm doing my thing. You know, I can definitely help you or we can talk about it, but. 
I'm not going to be throwing what I believe around at everybody mm. in your face, anything like that. I want you to be happy. I want to be respectful. I want to live a good life. Yeah. And I want to contribute and, you know, all these positive these things. These are good. These are things that people, w- w- these are pillars of which people should live their yeah. lives. And, and not that, you know, that well, my parents or other people in other religions don't believe that. Um, but it was that mixed with a lot of the Japanese, just like the philosophies and um, some of the Shinto beliefs and even just like like I was big in anime and sure and manga and all of that and just seeing all of that and it's just it seemed more much more interesting I don't know if it's <laughs> the gamer side of me I'm like oh it's cool they have like little gods for everything and it's all kind of more things. interesting I'm and sorry I like, but really, oh, watch. you know and then once you watch any of like the Miyazaki films oh yeah like Totoro you're like all right I'm sucked in this is this is all pretty cool I like I like I like all this stuff it's just fun and it's fun to think about like how everything eventually goes back sure into one thing and it's about balance. Exactly. And and at some point during during college and all that, I realized only because there was a bunch of, um, there was church drama and things like that yeah. with my family and the church. And, and, you know, I realized that, like, it was a negative influence. Sure. And I decided to kind of step back from that. And I was also, at some point, like, fourth year in college, I was also engaged. And that person wasn't very um, devout. Yeah. And so that caused kind of a riff with myself and my my parents for a while and unfortunately that that is probably one of the pivotal moments where i realized you know that they have their beliefs i have mine i don't like that kind of mentality of not being tolerant right no i mean and there's not, too much of it already but yeah. but it's like it's like we have enough on our plates just getting through life and being great people and, and contributing our, you know, to the world in general right. for us to like kind of quibble over the little things and, and force our opinions or our beliefs on other people. And oh. so all of that's lightened up. Everything's great now, but yeah. that was kind of a pivotal point where I was like, you know, I need to reevaluate a lot of these things that I was taught. That's, I and, mean, that's a, that's a big moment to have, whether it's because of love, love often causes us mm-hmm. to think about things in that way. In this case, it was kind of a relationship and some, sense that caused the wedge maybe yeah but that's okay you know because now you are an equal opportunity lender you yep. don't judge people for what they think is right and wrong and then i'm making some kind of narrative here but you know it, it carries on our judgment our judgmental nature if someone's ordering a drink oh pff, they want an espresso martini really or yeah you, vodka soda dude who gives a fuck like you said it's already hard enough just being yeah existing trying not to fuck up everything and trip <laughs> over yourself every day when you get out of bed so that's an amazing thing but the first kind of path for you is engineering is that fair software engineering at that time it was uh you have offered a dual programs with electrical and computer engineering okay computer engineering and so so yeah that was the and I, I got lucky you know it was i was going through high school I had some friends, and then they all went, went to college, and they were all doing that. So I was like, cool, I'll do that too. I didn't really give it a lot of thought. <laughs> it just happened to be, luckily, that um, I'm, you know, I was, I already knew I was big into tech. Sure. Much more logical-minded, all of that. And so engineering just kind of worked, and I ended up being one of, like, two out of, like, six friends that actually went through and finished the program. That's that's great. I didn't realize And it so was- it was, and like I said, it just kind of was like, oh, no, this stuff's really cool. And Does that come so, from anywhere? Like, would it, your mom and dad were they either in that that field, like kind of electronic or kind of no? Like neither field? of them actually have degrees. My dad went to the Air Force. That's no what uh, that's what guys that lived in a uh, Mars Hill, Maine, did. Okay, fair. And so they're like, okay, we either got military or we farm. <laughs> so he went. He did the military, and that's how he met my mom in Japan. That's amazing. Okay. And so yeah, um, so yeah, it was just that's just the route that kind of life took me on, and yeah. then finished that. Um, that engagement I was talking about that didn't work out. And then after that, just, I was, you know, I, I did some, I did a lot of service industry stuff while I was in college, yeah. right before I worked, you know, at a place called Horizons, which we worked with, say, people that were, um, what's, what's the right way to say it, um, like mentally incapacitated, yeah. couldn't take care of themselves. So that's what we did. We took them around, helped them do jobs, um, babysat, things yeah. like that. So that was cool. That was seen like in, into a whole nother world. Right. There was Cracker Barrel. Uh, <laughs> a whole nother world on its own. Yeah, too. I was there for about six years. Really? All through that, yeah, working at different ones. And um, yeah, through college, I worked Cracker Barrel, GameStop, Horizons, and even and did some of the the lab stuff, like yeah. lab, uh, lab tech. 
hodgepodge at the things. same time all yeah. through going through school because that's what got me through college so man well because there is this glimmer in your eye when i mentioned cracker barrel there's a yeah, deep that, respect that, that, for it <laughs> yeah there is i mean people are like oh you said cracker barrel. i was like no i went from dish to dish trainer to server to server trainer it's yeah like, i mean i liked it there that's i so, think that's and, amazing yeah and so i enjoy it and then um during college i also did some uh, door stuff bartending you know bar backing on the beach and that's <sighs> terrible where life that's where I was like, you know, I, I'm kind of really like the the drink making stuff, and so, and then, then I would also, make, you know, I would do that there. I'd make drinks at parties. I yeah. love doing that. But you consider yourself a so because the thing is with engineering and any very, whether it's mechanical, electric, it is really binary in most cases, on off, on off, right? Now you can be a little bit more creative if you talk about developing yeah. UI and stuff, right? But it doesn't really, to me, say it's not a creative outlet, a creative field. Now I'm sure there's probably some philosophical things because <laughs> I see your eyes rolling a little bit. But well, no, it's so yes, I do consider. I guess I, I consider myself an engineer. But the thing I like about engineering is the problem solving. Yeah, I like taking something bigger, breaking it down into small pieces, and attacking it until you you come out with something at the end that's you know some semblance of what you were trying to achieve. Right. So how does that um, translate into a drink then? I guess that's what I'm getting at is that dr- if drink- you go down a path. Drinks are kind of creative. They're kind of good. They're they orchestral. Are. And, you know? a, and programming and doing coding and things like that. It can be too. Um, sure. There's definitely a bit of elegance to some of that. I actually say I'm more of a bigger picture, like architect style. Mm, so okay. I like to actually sit above one level and be like, okay, what, you know, say, like, for instance, now I do also have a master's in software engineering. Yeah. And so that's what I primarily do now. And so I manage an open source software toolkit. Uh, we deal with taking data from GPS satellite receivers, using that to do a bunch of analysis and um, uh, interesting things for even your own programs for working with that data. And so, well, there's an external community, internal community. How do I balance, you know, all these developers and multiple projects internally that use this product as well as the external developers? And so it's kind of like this higher level architectural piece of knowing all the technologies involved Mm. How do I make sure it's stable, the quality's high, all these things? Yeah. I, I enjoy that, say, more than actually diving into the code and just sitting there and just and typing things up. Yeah. And so in terms of drink making, for me, it's like a really condensed form of like writing a program or doing some project because in in a couple minutes, I go from getting the requirements from somebody, <laughs> creating, figuring out like what best I need to do like what components I need to put together to sure. solve that. You got a budget. And then I present the solution, <laughs> and then right then I get immediate feedback on whether or not it was good or bad. Yeah, Versus I like a project that a lot. which can take like Six. oh cool we have a twelve month deadline. Right. Yada yada. So like by the time I deliver it twelve months, I'm like, what did I even do like six months ago with this? Like, there's you know the dis- there's a disconnect between like oh man, I'm making some awesome change. Yeah. And then I find deliver by then. I don't remember. I'm just like, okay, are they cool with it? No. Okay, let's do the next revision. So the immediacy is pretty gratifying. It, it is. Like. And there, there's a bit of that like immediate gratification portion of of that where it's just like small bits of problem solving. Yeah. Right? And, I, and I love that. And then it's it's diving into like, okay, every component, how can I keep increasing the quality? It's like, okay, ice, the garnish, the glass, where it all <laughs> matters. And then like, okay, this specific spirit well now i need to actually go learn about this spirit and, yeah. what, and what other spirits are in that category that i can plug in here that and i know what that makes that up so like gin what botanicals yeah what ingredients and so there's something about that whole process or even like sake and different regionalities and the different styles or show you the same thing it's diving into that it's a bunch of that like learning and then problem solving with that knowledge that you learned yeah and that's part of just what i love about that side so you can be creative on both sides but there's more immediacy in terms of the creativeness on the cocktail side no i like that a lot that makes a lot of sense i never really thought because drinks are in a sense transactional Mm -hmm. programs are not transactional Mm -hmm. they're long-term things with a bunch of people involved but you delivering this thing you're the composer and also the the director and the editor and cinema everything and the guy that's marketing it yeah it's kind of nice it's end nose to tail as they say yeah of a cocktail so can you think of a cocktail that maybe you created or even something classic that at that point you're thinking, shit, this is actually something that isn't really, really interesting. There's so much potential and capacity for learning here. I've been having that, or I've been thinking that a lot with some of these shochu cocktails I've, mm. had to, I've been diving into lately. You know, I get usually obsessed with a style or a spirit yeah. for a while. Yeah. So for a while there, you know, obviously I did sake. 
so I love sake, but I'm not the biggest. I'm more of a purist. I don't really like sake cocktails. So mm -hmm. um, if I want to do cocktails, I'm going to go shochu. You know, and then it was gin for a while, um, tiki style, yeah, which yeah. I'm still big in the tiki Whole style. other discipline, man. Yeah, which that one I was like, I got lost because I grew up in Hawaii. And so for man. me, like like that, and I want to infuse like some Japanese stuff into it. And so we have a couple at Soto, a couple of tiki styles. And so oh, that's great. But um, right now it's working with the shochu. We just released two shochu cocktails on the menu. One's a shochu old fashioned. Okay. And so it's like a barley shochu blended three different bitters and just two to one demerara syrup in there. Mm -hmm. And people are loving it. It's become our new top seller. But just playing around with the different ingredients and nuances, you know, I've talked to Mike a lot about like, it's like working with shochu is interesting mm -hmm. because it never really works the way you th assume it's going to work. You just say, like, okay, really? It's like I'm going to work with whiskey, but because it's usually lower proof, 25, or in this case, a 35, mm -hmm. and there's no, say, aging in wood or anything, the bite's not there. I mean, how you think it's going to translate doesn't always translate the same way. Yeah. And it's like so. a soft-spoken spirit in a sense, right? It, it is. It's got m so much dynamics as we're tasting here. Different layers, too. But you can eclipse it with just too much of anything. Bitters oh, especially, yeah. right? And even just too much agitation. Yeah. Suddenly you're like, well, where'd the shochu go? It was just there. If I, you know, if I shake it five seconds instead of seven seconds, yeah. the flavor there is just really potent, but just that little bit extra shake, and suddenly it's just muted Yeah. Um, because just that red amount of dilution hit. So it's just... It's interesting, and it's been fun diving in and learning all about the history and all of this, you know, creating educational material for um, SAC, mm -hmm. for um, the, the classes I'll be giving. I'm going to be doing a shochu class at Kamuri this week. Oh, cool. Then I plan to do Industry one. or public or both? Industry right cool. now. I just do, I do the sake classes over at Kamuri and, of course, at Soto. And then I'll be, now I'm doing so shochu, which yeah. just makes sense. And so eventually I'm going to do Japanese whiskey in that mix. And so, but yeah. Another more expensive frontier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And no, Japanese whiskey's fun. Luckily, there's not as much of an awareness. Yeah. You, there's, you don't have to do the awareness campaign for Japanese whiskey. It's like, it's whiskey. And people are like, ooh, really? And then, or if they've even heard of it, they're like, ooh, I want it. Yeah. They don't care about the higher dollar. We have been trying to build up a pretty big list. We have about 38 different labels right now. Of Japanese whiskey? At Soto, yeah. Oh, wow. I just... I have to I run around and just grab everything I can find. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think there's only a couple right now that are missing. And so, but a few actually. But yeah, I'm very I'm proud so far of our collection. Well, so, all right. There's one big move here from Florida to Austin that I'm curious how this whole thing worked out. Mm -hmm. And so, shall we enter chapter two or the second half with some Japanese whiskey? I think so. Okay. Good. I didn't, it was, it, I didn't have to twist your arm. It's really yeah. good. So tell me about this guy. So this is EY. So this is a whiskey by Mars, So which is another big distiller from Japan. Everybody knows Centauri and Nika. Sure, of course. But uh, Mars is also a big player over there. So a lot of their stuff is really interesting. This is, if you've ever heard of like Centauri Toki, uh -huh. which is Toki. like... Lighter, light whiskey in a way. Yeah, which is like, you know, which is great with highballs, which is what they really push it for. Um, this one's got a little bit more of an age statement too. You can tell by the coloring. Yeah, it's very dark. And so we use this, you know, people are like, I want a Japanese whiskey old fashioned, but I don't, I want, you know, I don't want to pay a lot. Right. And so this is the one we go with. It's got nice spice to it. It's got nice wood to it. It goes great. It's 30 bucks if you were going to go like total That's wine. So it's yeah. great introductory Japanese whiskey. And it's very familiar because it's very similar to like, you know, just your normal American grain style whiskeys. Yeah. Are you stickler for proof at all on whiskeys? This, this is 80 proof, so this is kind of the minimum. Yeah, I'm not too stickler. Um, yeah, I'm not a stickler for for proof, really. Mm. Mm. I mean, in terms of, like, say, how I build old-fashioned, I pay attention to those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we have, we have some fun cask stuff um, from Japan that's, you know, about 120 proof. And so there's some fun. Now you're talking about the, the antithesis of the Sochu at that point, yeah. right? <laughs> so, I, but I, Austin's a lovely place. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been here now? Since 2013. Oh, cool. Okay. So just approaching five years, yeah, around five years. Almost five years. What was the impetus for the move from Florida to Austin? Let's see. I was recently married in Florida mm -hmm. to my wife now. Sure. And one of the first things I told her when we started dating was, 
just so you know, I plan to get out of here. <laughs> um, what did she think about that? She's like, all right, cool. I want to too. I was like, Good, all right, perfect. Awesome. Was she a life for we're gonna Floridian work out. too? <laughs> uh, yeah, we actually, um, it's funny. She actually went to high school with me. I dated what? one of her friends. Didn't really know her that well. And then we re-met at our 10-year reunion. So very cliche. Wow. But... <laughs> That's not cliche. That's a great rom-com waiting well, to yeah, be written. No, yeah, exactly. So sorry. <laughs> yeah, more of a rom-com. Yes. But yeah. I'd watch so... it. Ben Stiller's going to be in it probably, right? Probably. Yeah, yeah. I think that's all great. Okay, so... She's already on board to leave Florida. Lifers. Yeah, and I mean, Florida. Florida's great. We li- we work next to, or we live next to, like, one of the biggest Air Force bases, Eglin Air Force Base. Yeah. And I worked for civil service for the Air Force. And I was, um, what was I? Suddenly a senior uh, radar analyst. Okay. And so, basically, that's why you saw me on on that video for the Discovery Channel. That's right. It's one of the most secret structures in the U.S., but it was a 13-story tall radar, a space radar, and we would just like say we would track debris, track the ISS, track launches for us, wow. adversaries, all that fun stuff. Security is the security clearance pretty strict at that point. Oh yeah, TS oh. and all that. Really? And so and so I was doing that, and I was there for a good six years, and but at some point, no real upward trajectory. And the thing about engineering for me is that while I love engineering, I don't usually stay on one topic for a very long time right and so like like i have different topics right now i want to work on that i don't work on right now you know it's just based on what i'm interested in at the time and so after six years i was i was getting pretty restless you know and my choices were either to move around within the air force civil service Mm -hmm. network which is pretty easy to do and they have great benefits of course or i targeted like kind of universities all around the u.s that are interested in so one was hawaii because i was like ooh. Go back go to back, Hawaii. Yeah. Austin was one. Uh, Denver, Boulder area was one. That's nice too. And so, so yeah, I mean, around that area in Florida, it from where we lived, it would just to go to, say, to the grocery store, it took like 45 minutes. Oh, shit. We lived in the middle of the boonies. Um, the only things to really go do is go to the beach. Yeah. Maybe go to a shopping center. N- now, now looking back, food options, drink cocktail options, not too good over there. Yeah. Um, except during, of course, uh, tourist season. And so if it wasn't tourist season, it was everything was dead, closed up during tourist season, everything was too busy. Yeah. And so just getting a little restless, I wanted to go to the city where I had an opportunity to either pursue a PhD mm. or I can look into getting into a different industry and business and all of that and just have more opportunity. And same for my wife. And so Is she in the same industry? Oh, no, no, that's right. Arts, we were talking about this yeah, photography. She was right? a photographer. She did beach photography and all that over there and, and product photography. And glitter photography here in Austin, Texas. Now, yes. <laughs> she does that here. I, um, and so I was like, all right. And so I would just, I started prepping and, oops, excuse me, applying everywhere. And so I had a choice between, I was given an option to take a job in Misawa, Japan. Wow. Which is like ice festival, northern tip. Okay. Kyushu, just really cold <laughs> desolate and there was no interview or anything for it it was just air force just like hey you want to go here i was like oh, oh that's an interesting choice wow they cross the world i was like but it's japan and then austin called me too so ut yeah i was like hey you know we like to have an interview and all that but the problem was the, the japanese job was like we need we need your answer in like 48 hours 48 hours and i was like what oh crap and so i ended up taking the risk and say you know what? i'm gonna try austin so i just you know decided not to do japan for the first move, for especially for my wife, who's not really lived away from her family for, for too long, yeah. I felt like it was a bit too much. Uh, it'd be more of a cultural shock, and I wouldn't be able to pursue other avenues. Right. It'd be of, even more desolate, it sounds like. Exactly. I mean, it'd be great. I, I would immerse myself in Japanese, you know, just the society itself, yeah. and be able to easily learn, you know, relearn Japanese and, and all of that. But I feel that I would still be kind of stuck in that, you know, this engineering type not not engineering i won't say that but i would be in terms of my creativity and the things i want to work on yeah that would still be at a standstill although i'll be in a new culture in a new place right. and even my wife's opportunities would be different because well she's she wouldn't be a japanese citizen yeah and it's in the northern part like the coldest part of japan <laughs> man and so we're like okay i was like that was interesting and then the ut job was for applied research labs here and austin's an awesome city and so I was like, oh, man, there's opportunity to get into tech, all kinds of things. Sure. Just, just getting there is awesome. And then from that, just kind of see what happens. And so then came here to the interview, got the job, and yeah, so we came here. And so it worked out. So five, 
something years later how do you you and your wife feel about austin pretty st- glad still you made like, that move yeah um we still are want to travel a little more sure. she's still like i want to go see more you know, she wants to go to japan and all that yeah um whether here is home base we're still feeling that out maybe it's, here maybe hawaii yeah i mean you get some options kind of nice yeah either way it's like i definitely want to have like you know a foundation here in austin regardless whether i have something i've helped build here that i'm constantly back here yeah. for or just i want a piece of property here it's i mean godspeed if you yeah. can get a piece of exactly well exactly and so like maybe in in like huddo or something yes and it's like perfect. Cool, I'm close to austin good enough um you can see it but we, we love it. this city you know when we moved here I told my wife it's like look she was doing wedding photography yeah. beach photography product photography those and she didn't really love it i was like you know i have this job you now have the opportunity to do whatever you want photography wise so just do it like don't worry about going to get a sh- job coffee right. shop job anything like that and so she did and she it, and it didn't say like take off take off to where she's like a star but she really has been able to spread her wings creatively she's like okay i want to do shoots with kids and then she started doing fairy shoots yeah and then she started making costumes oh and man then literally every sunday i would be out there in the field with her dressing up a kid and all this stuff that she made with fairy wings i'm throwing glitter and blowing bubbles and all these shoots or using smoke grenades yeah and it was fun that is cool and she did that for about four years and now she's getting into a fashion design and clothes making that's she's realized she's she's now taking a step back from some of that photography to do that and yeah so but that led to all the things that she learned doing you know being able to experiment and try other things now she can she's moving forward with something else working with kids so often does it make you guys think about having a family starting a family any of that yeah when i married her i knew that she was on the fence when it came to kids yeah and um at the moment we've decided not to have kids yeah yeah i've and, made and, that same choice and yeah and and you know she she loves working with the kids and all of that um but she's just never had that you know she's great with kids too yeah I've always been just on the kind of nonchalant, like, yeah, if my wife wants to get off kids, but I have all this <laughs> stuff I want to do. So right. I'm not going to be bored in my lifetime that I can think of. Yeah. And so, and yes, there's always, you know, cause I'll tell my guy friends like, well, don't you want that feeling of having like somebody to pass things off to? And, That's kind of self-centered. And, a and all this. I'm like, well, I mean, yes, as a guy that sounds cool and romantic sure. and having like my own little, you know, kohai or whatever I want to yeah, call it, nice. sidekick to pass it off on. Cool. But you know what? I was like, but there's also a lot of like kids out there that are in need that could be that. Yeah. I'm like some, if just to say Japanese kid that's like abandoned or yeah. like orphaned, you know, it's like, I mean, how do I know that my kid's going to turn out to be somebody I want to pass off everything to? No, it's a good point too. You know, but I feel like there's a lot of people, there's a lot of kids out there that could use that. So it's like, you know, if I choose to do that in the future, I'd rather help one or multiple, you know, or just like you've mentioned before, just giving back in general yeah. to kids. And, you know, because I still want to travel, do all the stuff. I've always felt bad because for me, it's like, yeah, I have kids for my parents. <laughs> and, for my, like, I feel bad, you know, because they're always like, we're not having kids. And, but my, my sisters are often kids. So I'm like, see, it's good enough. Yeah, that's good. See, my parents realize the ship sailed. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be 40 before no time now. And my wife. I can't even drink. No, it's that good that it escaped. It escapes your Well, lips. it was like I was trying to dodge the mic. <laughs> <laughs> and I lifted it too high. I was like, ah, oh, crap. See, you've got too much, Brian. Obviously, I know. It's, I'm too, just like, it's too many one, drams. One sip of shochu is all it takes. Well, it lights the night up, baby. Mm-hmm. No, but it's one of those things. It can be very selfish, the motivations for having kids. It can also be very selfless. I, I'm, a, I'm not on the fence. I'm very, very, very certain about my decision. But I, I can understand, understand what people want to yeah. have kids. And the thing that's kind of interesting with you, and again, I find we're somewhat similar. You got a day job that's pretty good Mm -hmm. it allows your wife to pursue her creative outlets which is awesome which makes her build even bigger creative outlets which is probably good and bad right (laughs) yep well yeah it's like oh how much money will that take yeah that's right cool how many arts and crafts are in the house now yeah (laughs) but luckily she's always been able to pay for her equipment her cameras her computers yeah i've been like and i'm like oh cool you spent too much i can tax right off cool perfect and and so for me it's always been kind of a neutral neutral state Yeah, yeah it's not a positive influx but at the same time she's happy being able to be creative right not on my dime necessarily sure no i mean it's a nice balance i'd say yeah so you already had a day job Mm -hmm. you're working at least 40 hours a week and somehow that wasn't really scratching the itch and so what was the first foray back into hospitality here in austin was it soto up north it was soto up north and so you know i came here ARL, um, UT, uh, and the Space and Geophysics Lab, you know, they're great. Yeah. 
learned a lot of great stuff. You know, in the first year, published a paper, did a conference talk, you know, gave a talk at a conference uh, for GPS and what we do. Yeah. And did all this cool stuff. Um, one of the first things goal-wise I was trying to do when I got here was, am I going PhD or not? Yeah. Working with a bunch of PhDs, going to all these conferences, it didn't take long for them to convince me not to get it. Really? Which is interesting. I assumed like, oh, yeah, everybody, but yeah. Well, one reason was I didn't have a clear topic that I thought that I would be willing to sacrifice so much of my time right. and potential, you know, career potential to do. Like these guys are like, you know, we love what we do, you know, in terms of like what we're working on. Yeah. It's like, but in terms of like, but yeah, I've had to sacrifice so many other things for it. And so it was like, unless you have that one thing that you were willing to sacrifice just to push that field just a little bit in terms of like human knowledge yeah, further, yeah. just a little piece further, then don't get a PhD in anything. Because the amount of time and discipline you have to put into that, like you're going to look back and regret it if it's not something that you were just like super into. And I was like, okay, wow. well, that, that's a great point. Yeah. And I thought, well, at that time, I was like, there isn't <laughs> anything. Yeah. But that also tweaked to me is like, well, what are, what are, what, what is it that I want to work on? What is it that I still want to gain knowledge on? And, it, you know, around that time, now this part's a pretty cliche it's like it's reading a four hour work week and yeah. all these books because I'm like all right well i want to open myself up to other opportunities and so that's when i started going okay i really you know, you know made a list like these are things i want to do it's like i want to learn a lot more about my half japanese culture uh -huh. which up to that time you know i've been kind of lazy about it. it's like oh yeah mom cool don't really know much about my family in japan can't speak japanese all these things like all right so these are all on the bucket list sure you know, i need to do something about these um i love cocktails and doing all that and sounds fun at least on the side i like to re-pursue that route just to mm -hmm. see what happens because i really like doing it and i love doing parties and, and doing drinks like that and then after and then there was also okay well what, what tech things i'm interested in and so so that's simultaneously i decided hey i'm gonna get back into bartending just to see mm -hmm. you know it just happened to be that oh, i'm gonna learn i'm gonna learn japanese and all this and then i started getting into the tech side, which is how my Masamitsu tech brand and all that. And I, yeah, yeah. I was doing that pretty heavy there for, for a year or so, just like really into like IoT and big data and, and robotics and all these things, just to be like, all right, where, what is it that I like? Helped with uh, the IoT meetup here in Austin, all this stuff. But then I started doing the bartending, happened to land it at Soto, which I was like, hey, we need somebody right now. I was like, okay. I just moved there. <laughs> it was right next to my house. I was like, talked to my wife about it. She's like, well, you'll be busy, but hey, it's extra money, we can pay off debt. Sure. Because that's a goal of mine is to get rid of all debt, school debt, everything. And so I started that. Well, the guys had, that were running the bar had all walked out. So it was me and another person, oh, all brand man. new. So we're like, oh, okay. And what's funny is um, uh, Ty, who's, who was at Vox and is uh -huh. now over, he was actually the very first soda bartender that set up the first menu. No way. In that location. So oh, yeah. I didn't and I'd only heard stories about him. And so, um, and then one day I was in Nickel City. I was like, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you know, we, I'm going to manage the second soda. He's like, wait, soda? And then he told me that. I was like, wait, I heard stories about you. He's like, oh, because he would bring, oh, his, heard stories about how he'd bring his bartender bag in and he was like super serious sure. and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, I was like, that's cool. And then after now it's every time, you know, shots every time I see him. <laughs> so, that, made that for was life. A cool, yeah, yeah that, was, that was a cool connection. So oh, like, that is oh. cool. Because I had met him other, other ways, like through like kind of other Asian, like, cuisine things i just didn't realize he was this person wow that we that shared this thing with me so but um yeah jumped into that i was like okay gave me the opportunity to like so i just sat there and just absorbed everything i could i was like oh cool sake i don't know anything about this absorbed it um the one of the guys that had left previously we rehired him he's now one of my close friends and he manages the north soto oh cool bar program we both and uh, took the sake like sake Certified Sake Professional Course in mm -hmm. Vegas uh, by the Sake Education Council. So you can call it Professional SOM, whatever you want to call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But kind of first level. So that really, and then we came back and we re rebuilt the whole bar menu. And that really kind of triggered something. It's like, cool, now I can do this on the side. So learning Japanese spirits as I'm learning about Japanese culture and Japanese language because it all kind of forces me to going down this path. In order yeah. for me to be able to actually learn more about sake i have to eventually learn japanese yeah yeah and how to read labels and all of these things so it's like, helping you complete your bucket list inadvertently yeah. in a way and so for that i was like oh that's interesting how that all combined on that side on the other side you know i doing all the tech side and all that you know love doing a lot of that kind of took a step back from that but that is setting up say for 
kind of my next thing eventually that I want to do. So, you know, we'll see how long I am at ARL and Station Geophysics Lab and, and all of that. But I have some other tech things I want to do too. So I know you started like a like a venture group or something too. You got so much. Yeah, oh yeah. Not yeah. spread thin, but you got a lot of tendrils. Yeah, I have a local multiplayer gaming group for Meetup that yeah. we meet once a month, and it's part of the North Austin Game Night. We'll be starting back up in March again. I have a Austin Sake Social, which is more of an educational. Every we go to Japanese places, meet up, and just drink sake and, and all of that. Which how does one get involved with that lovely endeavor? Meetup.com. No sh- And just sign up. Yeah, it's free. Wow. And so, I, yeah, I've made multiple meetups and people have come in. They've loved sake and it's been really cool seeing that. And so I took a break a little bit for a couple months while we set up this new Soto, but I plan to start doing this out of Soto. Wow. That's, I mean, it's another, another allure to a great spot. And so you travel. So one, does, did your wife join you with this stuff? Does she enjoy drinking like you do? Or at least drinking and enjoying it like you do? Oh, yeah. Yeah. She, yeah. yeah. Like she's, I've, she complains because she's, I've made her more of a drink and food snob. Yeah. In a way. But she loves like a good tiki drink. She loves a good like actual like booze drink. She yeah. appreciates spirits now and she loves like she's she's more introverted. I'm the one who likes to go to the event and I'm just like talking to everybody. Yeah. And she'll just sit there and hang out with like one person in the corner and be happy. Man, that's a that I think is really helpful for relationships, especially in this industry. And so you you know, you've got the day job. The multiple endeavors, working with people, doing classes, doing education. You were a server and an educationalist at <laughs> Kimuri, too, mm-hmm. right? Where you, you talk about Mike a bit, which Mike's a great guy, best chest hair in the biz because he has so many few buttons in his shirt, it seems like. <laughs> I mean, I learned so much just, and I don't even know if he knows this, probably, but like just watching him because like, I was one of the bartenders. And just kind of secretly like, seeing just the little things he did. Just yeah. like, oh, I see how he batches that and does this. That's a great way to say it, you know, because he he had like he has like ninety something cover like seats there, and yeah. he has just one well, and so he did so many things to like streamline that, and so yeah. I incorporate that, you know, we have only fifty to sixty, you know, covers in terms of what we handle at Soto, and we have two wells, but still, I'm like I pretty much batch everything, yeah, as much as possible, multiple, you know, as little touches as possible per cocktail, just a lot of these little things that it's I. It's a very Japanese up. philosophy, though. Yeah, and you know, and so yeah, and so I just. I learned a lot just just creepily sitting there and watching him and all these things and you didn't even know. <laughs> Do you think that you're going to be able to walk away from the hospitality industry at any point and just focus Pro- on tech? Mm, probably not. In one form or fashion, I'll probably still be in it. Now, you know, a long-term goal is to, you know, become kind of an expert in sake and shochu, yeah. Japanese whiskey. Maybe do a little consulting, helping people build out or add those spirits into like a Western bar program. Mm. Um, I love like all the connections through distributors and all these brew ma- you know, the brewmasters. Sure. I love that side. I love just talking to all them, learning all the new things. And so I would love to start being able to travel back and forth to Japan mm. more often too, and just kind of and do that. And so, so you know, I I, I can always see myself doing this. Not in some way like or another. just behind like one wall, right, right. Like one restaurant all the time, but you know, just constantly just kind of expanding and just and just doing that. I love it because yeah, like um, if you've been to Kome, sure, Kome's got a great new bar program by Nalto over there and there. So they also have shochu cocktails. Cool. So if you want a good shochu cocktail, it's going to be Kome, Kimuri, or Soto South Lamar. <laughs> yeah, so of course they've got a <laughs> yeah. No, I just I just have this want to like get every all the Japanese restaurants kind of working together. Yeah, because we've we've talked about. <clears throat> or at least we've brought up, you know, the talk about training staff all together, like mm. all these restaurants, just having big giant like sake sessions and sake sessions. training sessions and stuff. It's like, why not? Like, let's just make this big here in Austin together. Yeah, I, lo- so. I love it. I think it's a great idea. And I think it's obviously the reasonable and realistic evolution of the cocktail scene here. Mm-hmm. So we're doing some great things and we can always yeah. learn. And there's mezcalerias, like we already got that covered. We've got agave covered in a lot of different ways, but not Japanese spirits and beers or sakes however you mm-hmm. like to refer to it so all right i got two two questions left for you and this was hopefully not as daunting a task to sit here and chat with me as it might have been when you listen to mike phillips <laughs> <laughs> interview but it was a real thing man real moment wonderful guy love mike to that oh, mike's awesome so you are sipping anything you can sip let's say your favorite shochu it doesn't matter what it is but you're in any bar or anywhere in the world and you can sit there and have a conversation and sip this lovely spirit, who would you 
be so excited to share a conversation with, living or deceased? Oh, man, that's a hard question. It changes from week to week, I think. No, it really does. Um, hmm. Trying to think of something like, because there's always like somebody I could pick up that. I would probably never have the chance to do this with. Mm-hmm. But then there's also people like, well, I'd love to sit down with this person who probably is within a couple, you know, arm's reaches mm-hmm. that I could. Um, but I'd probably be sipping, it's just show show old fashioned, just because I'm into that right now. Yeah. And so, not necessarily what I make, but just nice show show old fashioned. Hmm. I guess I'm, I'm big into tech lately. I would just say Elon Musk. <laughs> I've, I've I mean, been, why not? Yeah, I'm like I'm going for like somebody that I'm probably not gonna run into in my life. Yeah, but um, I'm I'm a big fan of what he's trying to do, not just like the simple things like oh SpaceX and cars. Right, right. His big plan and how all of those things he he's doing are all pieces for this huge plan he's doing. If this plan to colonize other planets. Yeah, and so it's it's kind of the ultimate, you know, like problem solving big problem breakdown into multiple pieces and actually seeing somebody actually over a long period of time moving forward on that. Sure. So electric cars, you know, habitats that can be solar powered, underground tunnels that would probably work great in Mars. Yeah. Um, you know, all, all of these things that he's building in these different companies. I mean, it's just... It makes a lot of sense. I mean, I would love to. I don't know what he drinks, but I'll, f- I'll find out just for that opportunity, <laughs> right? Exactly. So yeah. So I'll change Shochu to whatever he likes. <laughs> I'll bring it to get me at the bar so exactly. I can hang out. And so yeah. So I'm so I'm big on. Yeah, Elon's really cool. Yeah, so. I think so, man. And again, how it all ties together for the greater good and improving humanity itself instead of just himself. But a lot of opinions on the guy, and that's quite all right. There is, and like I said, I just like looking at the big picture. It is scary thought that. Like, if he's the only thing that's pushing that forward, if anything happens to him, yeah. like, I'm like, oh no, because yeah. I want to see it. I want to see it come to fruition. Just yeah. like all those little those goals, because of how hard that is. I mean, it's incredibly ambitious to say the least. Oh yeah. All right. So the last question with this education, this orderliness of your cognitive process, we'll call <laughs> it that. Do you see yourself venturing into authoring and writing a book about this? passion of yours with japan i do actually and so my first foray into the writing is actually creating the website called japanese spirits.com yeah and that's just gonna have like so so you know it's gonna have sake shochu japanese whiskey and just some of my writings about it some 101 stuff about it Mm. you know and then i have some other ones i'm working on with industry stories and all these like really fun interesting things and eventually i'll take all of that and compile it into books that's great just just you know i guess that's what they do now in the blogosphere but it's it's for me it works great cool i can write it in pieces yeah and then eventually do that but no yeah writing and and things like that have always been something that i'd like to do at some point somehow i knew (laughs) somehow i could see it on the horizon as a next logical step for you it was if anything it's just an easy way to be able to be like okay cool Hey guys, here's a great way to learn something and just like, just distill whatever it is yeah. that I've distilled that way. They don't have to do that. They can then take it on one step. And you know, versus me having to repeat the same thing over and over. <laughs> so just again, efficiencies. Efficient. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Well, we shared some sochu, we shared some Japanese whiskey. Honestly, we're really on brand right now for the <laughs> Japan brand. This is perfect. I, I'm going to come visit you as soon as possible in Soto. Mm-hmm. South Lamar, and I can't wait to see what you guys are doing next. And you, we'll talk more about this education piece and this kind of chronicling these brilliant insights that you have about Japan and its corresponding spirits. So, Brian, been brilliant chatting, man. Yeah, it's been, it's been great. Thank Good you. Good dude. Salute. Yeah, come by. Well, there we have it, Mr. Brian Masamitsu Parsons, formerly of Soto, now spreading the sake and sochu love at Kamuri and Ramen. Tatsuya, a brilliant guy, super intelligent, has a scientific look on things, but yet loves people and the hospitality elements. And it's good to have him in Austin. You know, he's a creative guy, but he balances that left brain, right brain stuff out quite 
Well, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with me, Brian, and I cannot wait to sit down and sip some delicious sake with you. So thanks, everybody, for listening to Show to Be with Mike G. No matter how many of the 50 horror movies you haven't seen that you should watch, you've seen as I'm watching Alone in the Dark, or if you're thinking, man, it's getting pretty hot in here, please, you can't.